And uh, we'll try to time your way at 7.15. Yeah, 7.15. Okay, so. Give us two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to say? There you are. Yeah, Ben, sure. Good luck. Is that car diesel, Michael, or petrol? I got them cut in different lengths. First, sometimes you only want short lengths on that tray, and other places sometimes you need the long ones.
The idea of tying them up actually like this to save on the morning and to make it a little bit quicker and easier. It's a fiddly old job doing it, but, but if you don't, don't tie them together before, it takes longer but the time of doing them. Mm -hmm. And after the morning's over and we finish, they got to be cut off before we destroy the branch. Sometimes I get them caught up in branches and bits them and pull them off and I carry a few spare ones if I want to replace them. Four, three, two, one. Okay. The main thing is to make sure you get them nice and tight that they don't slide out because they're at the slide, these ribbons are enough. That's when you tie them together. Some of them have faded a little bit now in the years they've been about from the sun and that, and rain and different things as which have been on them on wet days and made them run, some of them. Like 
that one there, for instance, was a, a blue one, and that's from when it got wet. It's got with the others and faded, faded out.
I'm going to try not striking there. Try. Oh, yeah, can you put that there? Whoa, whoa, not too much, you go one extreme to another. Wow. Back. You get a new sponge. Alright. You'll have to come off down there. Okay, the plug. You want to come out here? You want to go back there and have a look? Oh, you don't want to put that. Yeah. You wa is that the front of him there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Turn it around there. Back. Oh, right there, isn't it? No, too far. Back this way, is it? Yeah. yeah. Come out here, Rick. Yeah. So we'll lower his tail, take him out there, and have a look there. That won't be too short, will it? Better. Yeah. Let's put a couple of dead pieces there once through there. Alright, let's have a look at him there.
carpet to come off with them, right? There it is. Careful. Uh, you want a bit further back. Where do you wrap them on? Well, um, well, well, um, I stumped some of you on that outside. Thank you. Thanks for having me. On that on there. Decorate, decorate the tree on there. Lift the things off after that. Oh, no. And then they don't jump too much. Oh yeah. Oh, he's got a light blue, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Um. Well, you can see the light blue on it. You know the other night? This company rang your ass at 11 o'clock to finish doing these. Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, longer, most probably. Yeah, it is. Oh, well, I'm going that way. Yeah. Once you've been sitting there, you don't know whether you're going to make it again. Oh, that's right. How about that? You've got a few ales in your life. Right. Thank you. 
Don't put that on the X mark. You got both up here. Oh, 
Leave it on now nice, because it's uh...
Is it?
That's better than where I was the other day when I asked the question and my neighbor immediately said, well, I can hear, I'll change places with the person out the back. <laughs> <laughs> One of the um, privileges of taking the chair at a perfectly magnificent lunch like this is that I am spared the agony of waiting for the Toastmaster to summon people to order by knocking the table with his gavel and say, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, pray for the silence of the Member of Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> they say abroad, they always used to tease me as an Englishman in Canada, that an Englishman laughs three times at every joke. Once when it's told to him, once when it's explained to him, and the first time when he sees it. <laughs> But I say, we do have a slight nest an ordered existence sometimes in London. And, um... Thank you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I didn't think you cared. I, I hate to deprive the leader from the vanguard. <laughs> the lack of comfort was getting on me. <laughs> but there were two... Yeah, what? There were people from a psychiatric institution who came to our house and were uh, in the gallery watching one day and they began to feel more and more at home as the booze started and the cat calls started and eventually two gentlemen <laughs> with swords and knee breeches and black stockings led out the honourable gentleman walked over. <laughs> And then the division bell rang, and all hell broke loose. People scurried in all directions. One turned and said, oh, I told you, one of them escaped. I'm here today, first of all, to say thank you, personally, because somebody else will be saying a more general thank you later on. They personally enjoy your hospitality and have invited me once again to take the chair at this very important gathering for function. When I saw your vicar this morning, he greeted me with the words, Were you cast to the lions in wrath last Sunday? <laughs> uh, I thought for a little while, where was I last Sunday? I suddenly realized I was, in fact, cast to the lions. Now, unlike your vicar, I don't know that I claim I try sometimes to be Christian, but I was immediately put in mind of the Christians who were thrown to the lions in the days of Nero in the Roman arena. And on one particular day, the poor Christian was standing there waiting for his lion. And the lion came bounding out. <coughs> and the Christian walked up to it and whispered something in his ear. And the lion slunk away and disappeared down a hole out of the arena. And another lion came in. <coughs> I'm working on it. And the Christian walked up to him and whispered something in his ear and the lion <coughs> and slunk away out. And the third lion came out <coughs> and the Christian walked up to that one too and whispered something in his ear. This was more than Nero could stand. He summons the Christian to the front. Had him stand in front of him and he said, Christian, I can stand it no longer. What he that he tell those lines that sorts them out so completely. And the Christian said, Caesar, I address them quite simply. I just say, of course, you will be making the speech after dinner, <laughs> won't you? these thought processes running, they, they just never quite stop. Because, and, and I must, this was premeditated, because I, I did think I would have the pleasure of, of the company of your vicar today, knowing how seriously he takes these very important matters, starting with the church service in the morning. And that is, there was the missionary walking through the jungle, in Africa, when suddenly he came face to face with a lion. And thinking, oh, this was the end of everything. 
He collapsed trembling to his knees. An interpretation in fear, possibly even fast, put his hands to his eyes and waited. Nothing happened. So he peeked his fingers apart. And lo, across the path, or in the path to further across the river, was the lion also sitting on his haunches, <laughs> with his paws up in his face. Uh, and, and hope swelled. It bloomed. It became positive optimism. We were all right. When the lion pulled his paws away from his face, looked at the missionary and said, I don't know about you, mate, but I'm saying great. <laughs> it has been a lovely day today. And I really said to myself as I came into the village I found here today. Uh, what's the right word? A note of, I made a note to myself of a thanks. A thanks to the committee, thanks to the team, thanks to the society for transforming today the face and the atmosphere of Founder. It's difficult to say that one should uh, transform the face of Founder because Founder is quite without exception. No, could be very careful. Founder is exceptionally nice as a village in heritage. It does have its own character, its own charm, and it always looks attractive whenever I'm here, whenever I come through. And that reflects, of course, the spirit of the village and its leadership <coughs> and membership and all the effort that's put into it. But today, it had that something else. I certainly couldn't say je ne sais quoi, because I knew exactly what it was. Today it was carnival, it was festive, it was different. And I think that there has been <coughs> an immense amount of thought that have gone into the creation of today, the club walk day of the society as being a special day, a day above all days. And of course, for the weather to come out and join that <coughs> is a final conference. The work that goes into this, I know full well. And I'd like to express my personal note. I'm quite certain I reflect that of others when I say thank you to members of the committee for what they've done. When I, uh, I think, draw attention to this remarkable achievement, the transformation of the village, the transformation it needs to that extent of club walk today. These things do need change. They do need up. And uh, it's nice to know that the society and the spirit in the village is as vigorous as ever. And that means congratulations. Certainly, it would be very invidious to pick out names, but uh, Mr. Lewis, I know, your secretary, has been um, very hard working in, the, in, this, in, this, in this matter. And yeah. 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 before to remark on the very significant speciality of this particular day. I've remarked upon, I've, I've admired the mystique and the achievement of the selection of the oak. And I put that with a capital O today. I, I never dared to ask how this oak came to be selected uh, and, and, and until today, when I summoned up my courage in both hands and, and said to your chairman, my friend, how do you find the oak? You go out into the woods at 4.30 in the morning, and whoops, there's an oak. It's the right height, it's the right shape, it's the right span, it has the right number of branches, putting 300 ribbons on it. It's just there, and this can't happen by accident. Will I uncover the trade secret? <laughs> 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 it 
actually involves work. <laughs> a lot of work. A lot of dedication to the cause of selecting just the right oak. Mind you, mind you, I did hear a declaration of interest, which is a very important one, you know, because, and it is an important consideration to bear in mind, if the oak is not right, it is sheer hell to carry. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't it? <laughs> but I find now that I used to think in my naivete that you walked along and you looked up. But that's not the case. No. Around here we have ways and means of doing things pleasantly. Yeah. Because of the cliff, you walk around and look down. <laughs> and that means to say that a branch of oak like today, which was 65 foot up in the sky, is in fact visible before it comes. And what a remarkable achievement then having isolated your branch in the sky, then to go and get it, and come down with it, the both of you in one day. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it would be wrong not to um, draw attention as well in this piece of daring do to the uh, assistance of young Richard Wallace, who as the apprentice uh, <laughs> I suspect I've heard that argument. As a practice, yeah. has uh, been a very great help in this matter. <laughs> but isn't it lovely? Isn't it remarkable that the oak should look so perfect out front? And I would like to comment as well on the very fine standard, the very fine display decorated stadium. I thought this year, and I know the weather's been kind to us because the blossoms has been on the, on, on, on the hip rows for a long time, everything else has been coming out right, but I thought they were um, as good or better than I've ever seen them before. So I know how much work there is, so that I think it reflects the spirit and the aliveness of the village of, of, of town. Now my purpose in being here with you today is one that I look forward to from the beginning of the year and this next year starts on June 10th. <laughs> Through to the next occasion because I deem it one of the most important privileges <coughs> I have in the year to come along to Town Hope at this particular time and ask you to join in the toast to the Found Hope Heart of Oak Friendly Society. Just while I get everybody to stand, just sit still, because I want to put that thought in your mind whilst the vicar puts on his mind. Melodian. <laughs> <laughs> to be ready to accompany the toast when it comes. But I must say, the cliff above Found Hope, above Kepler, puts me in mind of that new fast developing sport which hadn't quite yet hit found her because of the trees and that's that one of hang gliding. Oh, oh it has <laughs> Stick around, chaps. <laughs> Stick around because there are people I know around here who like to shoot. <laughs> I, and I'm put in mind <laughs> of the person who liked to shoot, who was looking out of his window and he saw a hang glider pass. And he summoned <laughs> his gamekeeper and said, Carruthers, bring me my purdies. And Carruthers duly obliged. And on the lawn, he let rip with four barrels and winged it. And he said, Carruthers, I winged it. But you didn't kill it, sir, said Carruthers. Yes, indeed, said the chap, said the shot. But I made it let go of the poor devil it had in its tub. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my privilege, our pleasure. I ask you to rise with me and lift your glasses. Found hope, heart of oak, friend in
Ladies and gentlemen, you wouldn't believe that he has four trombones, three bass drums, and three cornets inside there, which is absolutely marvelous. What a lovely rendition of Master Bass. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask your secretary to respond. On behalf of the Fano Park Oak Society, welcome and thank you for such a wonderful turnout. It does a tremendous amount, not only for me, but for the whole of the committee. I also have to say how sorry I am, particularly, and the committee too, that we couldn't accommodate all those people who would have liked to have come to lunch today. We are extremely sorry, but we were booked up, what, three days before, and we couldn't ask the proprietor to extend the number because of our fire precautions in particular. So bear with us this year, and we'll make certain that you get a ticket next year, provided you apply earlier. Traditionally, on this occasion, it has been my function, only the second time, to relate what has gone on since last club day. It has been superseded by a quarterly newsletter to members, and so I'm only going to touch briefly upon the main features. We are very sorry to have lost two of our older members, and to both families, again, we express our condolences. Greater interest has now been taken in the affairs of society, due principally to more publicity. <coughs> Membership is just about the same as it always has been. Although people die, we get more. The juvenile section is certainly much more encouraging. Most members know, but I think the public should know, that the valuation of our funds, which is done by the um, registrar appointed actuaries, has recently been completed, which will result in increased benefits to members with a change of rules, future administration will make life a little bit easier for me. The juvenile section, not everybody knows this, I'm a little surprised, the juvenile section were entertained during the year with right. trips to all three yeah. towers. It was quite well attended. We, I would say that probably 50% came. Um, this, I think, has generated extra interest by the juveniles, and we're looking for more... Uh, members this next year. Well, Club Walk 1984, great day. I think it should speak for itself. Last year, I expressed the hope and desire that Club Day should broaden its scope by the involvement of other village organizations. There has been a magnificent response to our invitation to join in. No less than 18 organizations are involved in one way or another, and we hope you will give them your support by visiting that stand later on this afternoon. In addition, much generosity has been shown by the village business houses, and Mr. and Mrs. Williams, our new hosts here at the Green Man, have gone out of their way to make us welcome. I think you will agree they and their staff have done as well today, and we thank them for it. To the staff, we can show our appreciation in more practical terms when the judge is starting to be passed round now. The cost of organizing this day has been quite appreciable, and this year we organized a grand draw to meet some of these costs. But we would be very hard-pressed if it weren't for the generous gifts, both cash and kind, we received from our regular benefactors. To those ladies and gentlemen, we are most grateful, and to our hosts, who invited us to their homes this morning to partake of their generous hospitality, a very big thank you. The day would not be the same without you. The Lidbrook Band has again done us proud today, 
But due to the restricted accommodation here, they are having lunch in the new inn, or they've had it now, I think, uh, where they will be giving a concert. I think the concert will have ended. Yes, sir. Running a little late. I've just been over there. It's a great pleasure to have our vicar with us this year. Not only do we have to thank him for volunteering to deputize for the band, but so much more for the generous support he gives and the influence he brings to bear in the interests of our cause and that of the community in so many different ways. Coming to the end, Mr. Chairman, I now wish to express my appreciation for the tremendous support I have received throughout the year from my chairmen, past and present, the committee and members. I was sorry Louis Haines felt it was time to resign the chair, but admired his motives for doing so. His major contribution to the survival of the Fano part of Oak Society is well known and will no doubt be better described a little later on by a fellow trustee who is much more fitted for the task than I am. Today I wish to pay my greatest tribute to the Entertainment Subcommittee. Under its chairman, Michael Best, who regrettably couldn't be here today, that committee has been largely responsible for today's organization. There's been a great team effort, and I think the village should be proud of what seems to have been achieved in just one year. Mr. Chairman, we couldn't envisage the club day luncheon without you. In spite of your many commitments, you accept our invitation promptly and so willingly, and what is more, appear to be so at home with us. We thank you and hope you will see your way clear to take the chair for many years to come. <coughs> Finally, the members wish to make a presentation to their late chairman, Louis Payne, in recognition of his long and devoted service to the society. This, we thought, was a most fitting occasion, and in a few moments, I shall be asking you, Mr. Chairman, to invite Mr. Edwin Godsall, a fellow trustee, to make this presentation on their behalf. Mr. Chairman, Mr. distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the Society thanks you all for making this such an enjoyable occasion. And thanks all, to all those who are not here, who in any way have contributed to make this a great club day. Mr. Chairman, would you now please ask Mr. Godsall to make this presentation? Toastmaster, at least you don't get that in cups from here. Uh, I'm reminding of the MPs who the Toastmaster did approach and said, 
Shall I now get them silent for you, sir, or shall we allow them to continue enjoying themselves? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
That's that. Good, because they had to receive one fee from each member. Oh, <laughs> and they can't receive more than that. Only one fee. No talk about state affairs. No talk about state affairs. No reflection on religious principles. Again, you were fined. Sixpence. Two and a half feet. If you were rude to anyone about being on relief, or in the words of the thing, nasty it says, then you will find again a pound, uh, a shilling, five feet. And hear this, drunkenness, bad language, wearing a hat in the club room, or betting, incurred a fine of two and a half feet. Challenging anyone to a fight, so, there, I mean, the question arises, if these rules are strictly enforced, what did the average club member do? Or say, you know, that it seems to all be covered. So, 84 for you has been a year in which a lot has been done. Frankly, I believe, because a lot has been said. You started your work for this so early on, and the fruits of it are today. The planning that's gone on most of the year by the trustees. And Secretary's work has already been referred to. Um, Michael Best, in charge of entertainment, of course, has been able to give a little more time to it this year as well. <laughs> Quite unexpectedly, you know. And I sort of, you know, things have been a little slack, as they say. And, I, you know, ironically, I suppose we have to thank Mr. Arthur Scargill for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it'll be the one and only thing that we're going to pay for anyway. I didn't know the band weren't going to be here. Um, I didn't realise what was happening until the last minute. And I did just want to ask them, uh, following the Cole story about uh, Michael, what do you get when you drop a grand piano down a coal mine? And musicians will know you get a flat mine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is true, absolutely true, that when I met Mr. Shepherd today, I said to him, were you thrown to the line? Uh, what he didn't do was carry on the rather embarrassing story that I stood very near him on Sunday and wasn't absolutely certain whether it was him or not. Uh, he was wearing a hat. Well, he says it was a hat. Anyway, he was certainly wearing something. Else. And we've got an old joke in the, in the country, haven't we, you know, about keeping your hat on and then we'll recognise you. I'm afraid I didn't. I wasn't absolutely certain it was you. And anyway, quite honestly, Noel Gordon was much prettier than you. <laughs> tradition and you follow a long tradition of your predecessors in which you always share in this day with us. Mr. Lewis has already referred to you and the joy it is to have you with us. We know it is against the background of a, a very busy life. We know the pressures and the demands on your time are overwhelming and yet you still make time and I'm sure it is a question of making time. I know you were at the Crown yesterday at the Lee. You've been on your surgery run, and that you just finished that run this morning, inherited, I believe, coming on uh, straight from that to us. And we're delighted to have you with us. We're deeply grateful to you because you share this event. Not to, and forgive me, don't misunderstand me. Not just as our member of Parliament, but you share it as our friend. Here, here. We assure you of our prayers. Which go to you and to yours. By the way, your wife kissed me actually New Year's Eve. I just kept oh. her. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't washed that side. <laughs> <laughs> remember that. Yes, indeed. It's my pleasure, so as well as my privilege, to ask you to accept this toast from us. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please be upstanding for the toast you have here? Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the toast, our friend and Member of Parliament, Colin Shepherd. Can <laughs> <laughs> you take another sip? <laughs> <laughs>
I actually. In astonishing good voice, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to put in mind of the pastor who gave a thundering good sermon in the church. He was asked, Mr. George Sharman, to propose the health of the visitor. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, at this lunch, uh, I was asked to propose the health of our guests. And I said to the then secretary, well, could you please provide me with a list of the names of the guests? <laughs> and he said, no need, no need at all. He said, you see the members are those that are drinking beer. And the guests are those knocking back the wine <laughs> yes, and the hard. <laughs> that that <lot. laughs> Hey, come on. <laughs> So, this year, of course, all that has changed. You see, our secretary, efficient as usual, asked me to propose this toast and provided me with a list. And I thought, well, no problem. They'll still be the same old lot, not in fact the forest of drinking the wine. But then I thought, uh, as I looked at the list, that I was not being asked to propose the toast to the guests. I was being asked to propose the toast to the visitors. So no one But I thought I'd better check. And just as a precaution, I looked in the dictionary. See, the guests and the visitors were the same breed. Mm -hmm. And honestly, a cold chill ran down my spine. You see, a guest is defined, or guests are defined, in the dictionary, as persons entertained at others' houses or tables. But a visitor, an observer, is an appointed official with the right or duty of reporting to a superior. And you are the <laughs> now, I'm sure you can now begin to understand my shock, my anguish, my look at our visitors. They are a star chamber, a grand inquisition, passing judgment on us. And who are they? Well, we've got an MP, a member of parliament. We've got an ex-Colonel, Colonel Clay. We've got the leader of the SAS. Here, here. <laughs> We've got our doctor. We've got our vicar, who doubles up. I suppose as an, an ecclesiastical disc jockey. <laughs> <laughs> an estate agent in Kevin Nathan, an art dealer in Mr. David Barclay, wealthy landlord, I must say, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and royal baron, <laughs> Ken Bell, <laughs> and a new station. I ask you, look at the gap. <laughs> and I want to know what they're reporting to. <laughs> Is it Arthur Patrick? <laughs> or Arthur Scargill? <laughs> who, or whoever it is, the friend of the country these days, I'm not sure. But these are the people that will be sitting there tonight. And I cannot now tell the stories that I wish to tell. I mean, 
I won't thinking and saying to everyone, make sure your member of parliament works for you, and the only way you can do that is by not re-electing them. I can't tell that story. You see, I, I, I am completely at a loss. I mean, earlier on, <coughs> the Star Chamber is now sitting. I was in the bar earlier on, and, I mean, if I say anything out of place, the chances are I'd be excommunicated. <laughs> now, I'm a little worried about that, but the chairman is not sure who should excommunicate me, Ray Howard Jones or Dr. Ramage. <laughs> <laughs> or both. <laughs> and uh, you see, in the bar earlier on, I heard the chairman talking to Kevin Mason and Brigadier John Foley, and he was saying, Bill, he was saying, if anything further goes wrong, Kevin, put the secretary's house up for a <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, a very, very decent chap, there was Bill May not want to move. <laughs> John Foley, he said, if he doesn't, he will, when I get my boys to divert the stream. <laughs> <laughs> really and truly, we are in, uh, I am in, in a very difficult proposing the help to our guests. But I, I would say that uh, on a slightly different note, that talking to Bill, uh, Bill Lewis, I did ask him the other day how it was that he became the secretary of the society, and he did say that as a result of being the secretary of the Western Society. He'd been the Secretary of Westerns for 12 years, and I said, well, how did you get that job? He said, well, it was quite simple, really. He said, they did want someone with some unique talent. <laughs> <laughs> he said, and they did think it would be, Northern the Westerns thought it would be a good idea to have someone in the boardroom who could read and write. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sincerely though, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I would like to, to thank all our guests for their tremendous support, their tremendous support today. But, you know, there is a certain sadness when I think of the guests that we have today. Because there is one guest who was a tremendous support of this society, who loved this day. And I think it would be wrong to let this occasion pass without mentioning it. And that is the late Geoffrey Hammond, yeah. who was such a marvelous supporter of the society. Yeah. Uh, I am reminded of the words of John Betjeman, and I think of Geoffrey when John Betjeman said he was a joyful guest a willing host with affection deeply planted. It's strange that those we miss the most are those we take for granted. And we will remember Jeffrey Hammond. Now, on a happier note, I think it is absolutely marvellous to think that Mervyn Davis, who has been so very, very ill, is going to be with us later today. Mervyn does send his apologies for not being uh, with us. But Mervyn has been very, very ill. He's now fully recovered and has been another guest uh, that has given tremendous support to the society. I think it was rather strange that the day after Mervyn made his reappearance at the Green Man, Rollo Belgium put it up for sale. <laughs> 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 but that may have been 
merely a, a coincidence. <laughs> I, I am also uh, one of uh, Mervyn's great friends is Moss and Sage here, and we welcome Moss uh, as a guest, a very uh, generous guest to the society. Yeah, yeah. I did hear the other day about a story about Mossman when he was a young man. Um, and apparently he was going out with a young lady in the village. This is a number of years ago, I <laughs> And apparently uh, he had been going out with her for some time. And one day she said that her parents were going out on the Saturday evening. And if he cared to go around at the house, if she could promise him a, a night of romance and passion. Although, <laughs> <laughs> although most of you is different, a different expression. <laughs> anyway, uh, on the Saturday, as the Saturday night approached, Moston went into Hereford uh, and called in uh, at the chemist's shop. And then when he arrived uh, at the uh, new lady's house, he was introduced to her mother and her father, and they had a few words. And then her father said to Marston, um, look, we, we were going off to the opera at Bristol this evening. Would you like to join us? And Marston quickly the past said, certainly. And off they went to Bristol, sat through the opera, got back at one o'clock, and his young lady, when he got back, was absolutely furious. Absolutely furious. She said, to him, she said, you never told me you liked opera. And he said, no, you never told me your father was a chemist. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to thank our guests in many ways. The support they give is expressed differently. Some give the society tremendous financial support. Others, the support given by their hospitality is quite staggering, now, sometimes in more ways than one. Others offer very, very practical support to the heart of our friendly society. But Mr. Chairman, there is one way in which you and all our principal guests give such support, and that is by your moral support, which I do not believe a price can be put upon. Because your active demonstration, your positive contribution, is a contribution to a better and fuller way of life. These qualities, are, I think, become all the more important, all the more valuable, and all the better in an age when a number of people that by, who feel that by fomenting distress, by causing disruption, by inflicting damage, even by desecrating churches, <coughs> they feel that this is their way of imposing their will over the majority. And I say to them, I've got news for them. As long as we have guests and sponsors 
such as we have today, they do not stand a snowball's chance in hell of succeeding. And therefore, we, at the heart of Oak, thank you, our guests, for making a sincere contribution, not only to the profound hope for living life, but for the English way of life. And I would therefore, on behalf of all members of this society, like to offer an outside thank you to all our guests who are the cornerstone of this society. And therefore, not only for your shining support, but your moral support, I ask the members of the Fanhill House of Oak Friendly Society to stand and drink for the health of our guests. To the visitors again. <coughs> to the visitors again. My mom. later on. We've all been very well fed and royally entertained by all the speakers. And on behalf of all the visitors today, I'd like to offer our sincere thanks to the Heart of Oak, thanks to Heart of Oak Friendly Society for having us here today and allowing us to take part in this superb occasion. Yeah, yeah. Here, here. Yeah. Yeah. gentlemen, it's been an excellent occasion, a most enjoyable occasion, a marvellous occasion, there is yet much more today to be enjoyed. I suggest we leave now in the full glow of proper illumination, and enjoy the sunlight outside, and make the most of a marvellous day that Found Earth has to offer. Thank you very much.
Anybody who knows him get them straight away. Now the knockout competition was a very hard fought competition and there was only half a point between the winners and the runners up. So it's very close competition, very hard fought. In the end I think that little edge of fitness uh, paid off because the winners were the Pound Pope Football Club. <laughs> Yes, half a point left where the Forge and Ferry number 40.
and we're going to ask Mr. and Mrs. Mervyn Davis to do the draw for us. If you stand around, we're going ahead straight away. Mrs. Davis and Mervyn.